Welcome to the home of 100 to 1 Faith TV. I'm Larry Gent, and this is the message for Grace Hartwood United Methodist Church on November 28th, 2021. Please join us in a word of prayer. O oh Lord, we hope to find you in the most unlikely places, as a child in a stable, a savior on a cross, a Lord in an empty tomb. O oh God, hear our prayers, which come from the unlikely places of our lives. Give us ears to hear, O oh God, and eyes to watch, that we may find hope and find you in this holy season. Amen. It's the first Sunday of Advent, so today we light the Advent wreath. If you have a candle at home, please grab one now and light it as we pray. Today we light the candle of hope. May our faith in Christ bring the light of hope into this world. The reading for this morning is from Lamentations 3. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to quietly hope for the salvation of the Lord. The New Testament reading is Romans 5. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we, are, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own great love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Old Testament reading is from Job 9. Then Job replied, How can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? Though they wish to dispute him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? How then can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. 
even if I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing. He would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. He would not let me catch my breath, but overwhelm me with misery. If it is a matter of strength, he is mighty. And if it is a matter of justice, who can challenge him? Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. Guilty. Although I am blameless, I have no concern for myself. I despise my own life. He destroys both the blameless and the wicked. He mocks the despair of the innocent. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression, and smile. I still dread all my sufferings, for I know you will not hold me innocent, since I am already found guilty. Why should I struggle in vain? He is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. If only there were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him. But as, as it stands with me now, I cannot. Job was a really great guy. So great that God said, Hey, Satan, isn't Job great? And Satan said, Of course he is. You've been so good to him. Take away his blessings, and he'll turn tail and run. And God said, Okay. Okay? Satan comes to try us, test us, tear apart our families, and God says, Okay, knock yourself out? It doesn't seem like God is holding up his end of the bargain, does it? Well, this is the first lesson of Job. Sometimes the ways of God just don't seem to make sense. We look for answers and demand to know why, but there is no why. There simply are days when life makes no sense and God gives no explanation. Job lost everything. Fortune, home, family, reputation, everything but a wife who says, Are you still here? I thought you'd be dead by now. And then things got really bad. Job's friends showed up, his religious friends. And they brought their cheap dime store religion with them. Please take a note. When one of your friends is going through a living hell, she does not need your advice. That person just needs a friend to sit with them. For a while, Job's friends did that. Then they messed up. They started talking. I understand that. Usually when I mess up, I find my problem started shortly after my mouth opened. Not only do they start to talk, but then they started to judge. That's another human reflex. It's natural. We hear about a flood. Well, why did they build their house so close to the water? We hear about a traffic accident. Well, why do people have to drive so fast? It is natural to hear Satan whispering, Uh-huh, you see, there's a reason for all that suffering. 
guess Little Miss Perfect, per, Mr. Perfect, with his perfect little house and his perfect little lawn and his perfect little car and his perfect little job and his perfect little family. Guess he isn't perfect. After all, the chickens are coming home to roost. Sooner or later, we might even start to say those things we've been thinking. That's what Job's friends did. Look, maybe if you admit you deserve this comeuppance, Job, maybe God will forgive you for trying to be so perfect. Finally, Job got fed up, and then he spoke the truth. Thanks a lot, old friends. You've convicted me before you even ask what's going on, before you even know what's in my heart. And you know, maybe God has done the same thing. If that's true, then maybe it's time for God to come down here and sit with me in person. Let him come and sit in court. Let me cross-examine him. Let me see his evidence. At that moment, all the angels in heaven gasped. Perhaps you weren't scandalized as we read that scripture, but for the people who first read this, the language was clear. Job just sued God. Job charged God with criminal negligence. Job demanded that God answer for his actions in a court of law. But Job wasn't done. He said, I know I couldn't question him if he did show up. He's a big old God, and I'm just little old me. But let him show up as a man, and then we'll have it out once and for all. Yes, let him show up like a man. Job threw down the challenge. Along with everyone whose heart has ever been broken, Job cried out, Where is this God when I need him? What does he know that allows him to judge me? He sits up there in heaven where it's safe. No one dies there. No one bleeds there. No one hurts there. Everything is neat and tidy, pure and holy. What right does a God safe in heaven have to judge residents of this broken world? What does God know about hurting and bleeding and crying? What does God know about dying in the dirt? Job challenged God, and God had to answer. So God showed up. He said, here I am, little man. Do you really want to talk back to me? Do you really want my job? Are you big enough to hang the stars or plumb the ocean? Are you big enough to understand what I do and why I do it? Aren't you a little small for that? Make the thunder roar. Hang the stars in the sky. Maybe then you can tell me I have failed. At the end of the day, this argument is true. Our hurts and worries seem much smaller when we see the wonder of God's creation, when we hear the power of the unending sea, when we try to count the stars, then we ask with the psalmist, what is a woman or man that you should pay attention to us? We are so small, and God is so big. 
And yes, that is true. And it does help to get things in perspective. But it doesn't answer Job's challenge. A lawsuit has been filed, and Job must be answered. That lawsuit did not go away. Let God come down as a man. And at the end of that chapter, Job said something amazing. Or at least let God send a mediator. When a lawsuit cannot be settled, and both parties must finally come to terms, then they must turn to a mediator. That is, someone who can hear both sides equally and understand fairly. Job's challenge reverberated down through time and space. It shook the pillars of heaven. It caused the very heart of God to tremble. There was a long silence in heaven as God contemplated the answer, a silence that brooded for hundreds of years. And at last, God gave an answer to Job's challenge. It was a glorious answer. It was awesome and terrible. But at last, God spoke. And at the thunder of his words, the heavenly host gasped and folded their wings in shock and awe. Job must have an answer. It is not enough for God to dwell safely in heaven while people die on earth. It is not enough for God to watch people without being part of their lives. Job must have an answer. God must send his word, and the word must become flesh. God gave an answer. When God sent his only begotten son to walk with women and men, to love and suffer with them, and finally to die with them. Job had to be answered. So it was that the answer came in Bethlehem of Judea some 2,000 years ago, and that answer was love. God so loved the world that he answered Job's challenge. He gave his only begotten son that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He gave his only son to be our mediator who can hear us and hear God equally well. Never again will there be a tear so bitter, a heartache so deep, a hurt so terrible that God himself does not know how it feels. God knows because our God has come down to answer Job. Our God has walked with us every step of the way. That was God's answer to Job's challenge. And that love is still God's answer to you. When your world makes no sense, when you desperately need an answer, this is God's answer to you. I love you. I am here with you in person, walking with you every step of the way. You must have an answer, and the answer is love.